you need to take action and not tomorrow. Don't make a note of it. Don't want to do it. I don't care how tired you are. You have enough energy to do one thing you've never done before. And that one thing needs to move you forward. Part of it should always be education. If you say, I don't read, then learn to read. Pick up a book and read it and actually do something. Make an offer on a house. Take somebody out to lunch that's done what you want to do. Do one thing today. Don't hesitate. Don't procrastinate. Just take action today that will get you one step further. Welcome back to the Better Than Rich Show with Eric Woolwind. And if you did not listen to Devin Woolwind's episode, I recommend going to check that out because Devin is the 16-year-old millionaire accredited investor with 40 plus properties. And Eric Woolwind is the father of Devin. And uh, Eric goes into everything from the family success triangle. We talk about uh, how he, uh, why he was bringing his son to uh, networking real estate meetings when he was five years old, how he uh, influenced his son to make his first business transaction uh, when he was five years old. Uh, we, we go into some really cool combos around homeschooling, breaking down finances, how to raise uh, young, uh, young professionals that know how to communicate effectively with adults and not be socially awkward. Uh, Eric has spent Uh, A lot of his years full-time in real estate as an investor uh, for over two decades. He's repositioned over a thousand units, including single and multifamily residential properties, as well as multiple types of commercial properties. Uh, He still controls hundreds of these. And he's written multiple number one best-selling books, including The Family Success Triangle. And now he's teaching not only his kids, he also has a 13-year-old who has 39 properties, uh, but he's teaching the world uh, how to simplify what it means to becoming a better business person, a better family, uh, running a family, running a household, and investing to create more freedom. So uh, it's a really fruitful conversation. I really think you'll love this episode of The Better Than Rich Show with Eric Woolwind. So welcome back to the Better Than Rich Show. I'm Mike Abramowitz here with Andrew Biggs and a very awesome guest today, Eric Wolwin. You might remember his episode of his unbelievable son, Devin, uh, who is on the show. And uh, Eric, welcome to the Better Than Rich podcast. Thank you very much, Mike. And good to meet you too, Andrew. Absolutely. Glad you're here. What was so fun is having the conversation. He, by far, your son was the youngest uh, guest (laughs) that we had on the show. Uh, But when Matt Drinkon suggested we have a conversation, I was like, all right, cool. I'll talk to a, you know, a 15 year old, now 16 year old millionaire, you know, someone who's an accredited investor and has 40 properties and all this. I was like, that should be an interesting conversation. And I was just so blown away with how he presented himself as such a young individual that I'm like, I want to know who raised this kid. So, so, so obviously this conversation is with you and I, I believe we're going to have a conversation with your wife as well. Cause I really wanted to have the two different lenses. So uh, w- obviously there's so many different places we can go, Eric, but I, I, I want to start with, why don't we start with why real estate? You know, Devin said that this is the, the vehicle you were taking the networking meetings when he's like five years old, getting him exposed to cash flow with Robert Kiyosaki why did you choose, like, there's so many different vehicles that you can teach a young individual, but you said real estate is the way. Where did that inspiration come from for you? And why did you select that vehicle for income? I believe that we started about the same way as everybody else. I came out of the womb. I knew I wanted to buy real estate. And by the time I graduated high school, I don't No, I went in every direction, but real estate. I was certain I was going to be a doctor. I was a medic in the army for 13 years, figuring, hey, if I become a medic, my grades are pretty good, but they're not straight A's. This will help me get into medical school. And then I ended up not going to medical school. I ended up going to, uh, I became a teacher for a year, anatomy and physiology, because that's about what you can do with a pre-med degree. And then I left there and I was reactivated by the army after 9-11. And I decided, oh, well, I'm a skydiver. I love this. And I'm an instructor. I want to buy the drop zone. So I'll buy seven acres and an airplane, some parachutes, and throw people out of airplanes for the rest of my life. And my mom convinced me that, oh, you're good at fixing up houses, which, by the way, with college and everything I've done, 
probably the most useful thing I ever did was build an addition on the house with my dad when I was 15. And thinking back to that, I realized I learned so much. I did all the wiring in there. I was laying brick. I was sweating copper. You know, I, I learned all of these good skills as a teenager. Then why shouldn't my kids learn that? And as an accident, I fixed up a house with the intention of flipping it, thinking, oh, I can flip a couple, have the down payment I need to buy the drop zone. And then I realized that why on earth would I ever sell something? You pay all these capital gains taxes. I could just refinance it, put almost the same amount of money in my pocket, and still keep $50 a month in passive income. And then 15 years from now, now remember, I'm well, you don't know, I was 29 at the time. So I figured if I could just do this about a dozen times, then I could retire on that. I didn't thoroughly understand operating expenses back then. It takes a lot more than 12. But at the time, I thought 10 to 12 would get me to a very happy retirement. And I could retire when I was about 45 years old if I got 15-year mortgages on everything. Well, fast forward a few years, I did a whole lot more than 15. And it just seemed natural that we were very deep into this, hundreds of properties in by the time Devin was born. And I didn't have the time to go to these meetings. Some of them I'm running, other ones that I'm a student at. So what do you do? You take your child with you so you don't miss anything. And I figured if I'm in charge, nobody's going to say anything about me dragging a kid in a car carrier. And so every Wednesday morning, I'd host a breakfast and I'd carry him in. I think there was only one person that ever said anything because he was a very well-behaved child, not like the second one. Uh, the second one was a lot louder. And by the way, if you ever want to talk to him, he would definitely be the youngest person because he's only 13 and has 39 properties. Uh, but yes, we'd take him in every Wednesday morning, which I'm de sure Devin told you. And he'd go out when he could walk. He'd start playing in the little kids area with toys. And then more and more, he'd end up sitting in on the breakfast meetings because he thought they were more interesting than the toy area. And next thing you know, he's asking questions. And then he's actually giving advice to adults about some of the things. You know, He doesn't know everything, but he knows one or two things really well. And that just kept growing and growing. And now he just turned 16 and he's the COO of my real estate brokerage. Well, that's that's amazing. That was kind of how I started. Yeah, I, I love the story, and I also love the you know the humility of hey, you know, um, I didn't know all these things. I had to go learn them. I had to go pursue them. I, I you know, I'm a self made individual, right? Is really what I'm picking up from you. And and then it was the hard work, the dedication, the follow through, and the education that you're learning. Uh, I'm, I'm interested, you know, one of the things you talk about a lot is getting people started, right? And, you know, sometimes it's difficult for someone who's listening to say, oh my gosh, you know, uh, Eric is so far ahead of me, right? Uh, you know, he's got this huge portfolio. Even his sons have these portfolios. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I can't even compete with the, his uh, 16 and 13 year old, let alone, you know, him. How could I even get started? Uh, what, what, what are your tips in terms of getting off the ground and getting that first deal? What would you say to that? Well, first off, I think people know why should you listen to me? And we run multiple businesses. My wife has a real estate brokerage that Devin's working at. I have my construction company. We have multiple property holding companies. The newest one, I've had a training company for a long time, but never really pushed it to make money. And it was, I think it was just two nights ago, we were all sitting down by the fire and said, man, starting a new business is hard, but we are doing the same thing. We just wrote a couple of books and we have a lot of money invested into publishing books and we are on podcast a couple of times a week and we're going to live events at least once a month and we're really pushing and it is difficult. You seem, it seems like you're just spending your tires over and over and not getting anywhere. And that is my advice. Keep going. Find a mentor that can push you in the right direction. And even though your tires are spinning, if you're pointed in the right direction, eventually you will get traction. 
and you will work and work and work and see no benefits. And then all of a sudden it trickles in a little teeny bit here and there. And then you take off like a rocket ship. So just don't quit. Don't give up no matter what. And every single time you fall down, you fail, you do something wrong. Just learn to not do that again. Adjust a little bit. And I love to think back to the first time we sent a man to the moon. Do you know that the ship that took the astronauts to the moon was only on course 3% of the time? The other 97%, they were off course and correcting. I did not know that. <laughs> that is, uh, that's actually quite fascinating. And I, I think about, you know, a lot of people that live, listen to the show are busy entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think everyone can relate to what you just said. They feel like they're constantly working, working until they get that traction. I would love to hear a little bit more about that before we circle back to real estate. You know, with everything that you've learned and your wisdom from your years of being in real estate, being in build businesses, building businesses. So you have enough um, foresight to say, I'm just going to keep going. So mm-hmm. what are some of like, if you got into the tactical, what are some of the tactical items that you're doing for this business? Obviously, it's easy and cliche to say, oh, just keep going. But it's like, what are some of the tactical things that you're doing? Uh, we talk a lot about like automation. We talk a lot about delegation. We talked about building systems. We talked about, you know, flow charts, if then. So if you have any uh, intel of what those focuses are for you as you're getting your business going, I'd love to, for you to riff on that or just jam on that. All right. What I taught really, especially Devin, what he learned the most, I taught him everything I could, but what he learned the most was be creative and take action. Nothing happens without action. And my wife is always the one that's struggling and trying to work hard. And I'm sure a lot of your audience spends their whole life. They were brought up just work hard. Well, working hard doesn't get you anywhere unless you're working smart as well. And of course you have to work hard. That's a given, but you need to go in the right direction. So what I'm teaching, notice all of these are the problems that they had, and I have all my own problems, but I teach them what they need. So Ethan, the youngest one, he needs to learn to ask questions. He needs to get a mentor and listen and follow. So if you're out there, everybody can get a mentor that's one of the best in the world. And maybe it's Robert Kiyosaki, Read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cash Flow Quadrant. Maybe it's Napoleon Hill, who has been dead for a long time, but Think and Grow Rich. What an awesome book. Uh, the E Myth, if you're learning to do setting up systems and running a business, The E Myth by Michael Gerber. And you can read these books for 20 bucks or for free if you go to the library. And that is where I started reading an awful lot of books. I listen to podcasts like yours every day. Everywhere we drive, I have a podcast on. Sometimes it's hard to hear when I have the convertible top down, but I'm still listening to a podcast to learn more. Tomorrow, I jump on a plane. We're flying out to Scottsdale for two weeks, and I'm going to another, actually a John Burley event, and he has two weeks of real estate training. And we're always going to these, both as speakers and as students. And as long as you're always surrounding yourself with people that are doing it, your friends that you make there can be your mentors. In fact, the newsletter that I just finished writing talks about, even if you don't like to talk to people, if you're an introvert, I just walk into a room and I'm suddenly surrounded by 20 people. Not everybody has that. Well, I wasn't always like that. I was the shy kid in high school. So you can learn and grow. My wife really, really likes to come home and get away from people. I have that same thing too. I don't mind being the center of attention for you know a weekend or a week. Oh, I can't wait to get back. I live on a farm. I'm in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by trees, and I want nobody around but my family. So if it's uncomfortable, you can't run a business without people. That is all that matters. The people on your team and the people that you are doing business with your mentors, your students, no matter what your customer is, you need people. So you need to learn to get comfortable with them. And that's another thing that we have all had to learn. So there's just a few of the things. Absolutely set up systems. It is never, 
your employee's fault when something goes wrong. It is always a broken system or your leadership. If you take total responsibility, which is really easy if you're the only person in the company when you're starting, but once you hire somebody, the first lady we hired did showings for us. If she messed it up, I knew it was my fault because I didn't teach her correctly. And as long as you're always taking responsibility, you will always have the power to make a change. If, however, I say, oh, Mike, you messed this up. It's your fault. Well, then I just gave him the power. Now he's in charge. So take control of your company by taking responsibility. And that is a big thing that I learned in the Army that I have always done that helped me out a lot. Hmm. Well, Eric, that is uh, excellent. I, what I gather from that is books. You gave a couple of really great mm-hmm. book examples. So keep learning, podcasts, keep feeding your mind. I think oftentimes busy entrepreneurs are so busy doing that they don't take the step back to say, I need to learn. I need to, I need to grow myself. I need to get new ideas, allow creativity to exist. So I love the learning aspect. You said mentor, uh, getting a mentor, someone that's a couple steps ahead of you on the journey. They don't have to necessarily be like, light years ahead of you. Ideally, they could be. But if you have an expert or just someone who's an expert in the one thing you want to get really good at, I think that's a great piece of advice as well. I also heard there um, as far and I'll kick it back to you. I also heard there uh, responsibility. I mean, if you are taking autonomy over your business and it's you're the person that's in charge, then it's your responsibility to make sure you're finding who's filling in the, the business with the right people, getting the right people in the right seats on the bus. And also having some sort of community of other like-minded individuals as running mates that you're also running with. These are some of the things that I gathered from what you just said, Eric. It seems like you have another thought on that. Thank you, by the way. This is yep. this is great. And then I'll kick it to Andrew. Perfect summation of that. And just to go back to what you said, it's great if you can get somebody light years ahead of you. Well, I, there is nobody further ahead of me in writing books. We had one book we published just so we could say we were best-selling authors and sold it for 99 cents on Kindle. And we did that. And then years later, Devin wrote his book, and he actually sat down and wrote it for like a year. And I thought, why would I? No, I don't want to write a book. So he actually wrote a couple of books. And then Mark Victor Hansen from Chicken Soup for the Soul and one of my favorite, The One Minute Millionaire. Uh, another huge lesson that I had my kids read very early on. He met Devin at a conference and Devin picked up Mark Victor Hansen to talk to us. Next thing you know, we're friends. A couple of weeks ago, I flew out and we had dinner together and, you know, we talk on the phone every week. He is light years ahead of us. And that's fantastic that I'm working with one of the best authors in the history of the world. And he's so far ahead of me, I can't keep up with what he's saying. I don't understand. And I know he's telling me the truth. I know he's not trying to hide it. He is such a kind and caring person. And trying to unpack what he can say in 10 minutes, sometimes, it's always, as soon as he calls, we put the phone on speaker so all four members of the family are there. And we'll talk for two hours to unpack everything he says in a 15 or 20 minute call. So sometimes it's nice to have that. And other times just to have the guy or girl that's one step ahead of you. I mean, you can go to your local RIA group. And if you own 20 properties and somebody owns 10, I guarantee they know something you don't. They don't have to own more. They don't have to sell more. So yeah, of course, it's nice to have those high level people. But you also need people that are closer to your level that are feeling the pain that you're feeling at the time. Uh, I find that really helps us grow as well. It's nice to have. And I have never, from the time I started, I have always been a teacher. I believe everyone their whole life needs to be both a student and a teacher. So if you buy your first house, you just proved you had the guts to do something that millions of people will never do. Take the time to talk about your fears, how you overcame them, the mistakes you made, what you did right with the new person that shows up to your RIA group that has never bought a house. And that will help make you both better. Hmm. 
So good, Eric. And you know, one of the things I love about what you're bringing through is is not just, of course, there's the how, right? Hey, this is how you find a good deal. This is how you evaluate, you know, uh, a property. This is how you negotiate properly. This is how you find a great lender. This is how you, like, you know, any any number of things that you could get into around the how. But you also are focused on these leadership principles, you know, the internal principles. Uh, you talk about, you know. Uh, be, do, have this idea that like, okay, I want to help people become who they need to become. And ultimately, if I do that first, then, you know, uh, the life of your dreams is a natural byproduct of that. If you, you know, follow the principles, you find the mentor, you stick with it, you, you know, you spin your tires long enough to eventually get out of the, the hole and start moving. Um, I'm curious when you think about, you know, those principles, uh, whether that's through the family success triangle or something else, how do you, like, what are the biggest uh, mindset shifts that you help people through, uh, the biggest limitations that people need to break through in order to become successful? Um, what, what holds them back? What would you say? Their own self-limiting beliefs. And you can break that down into three different groups of people. And we've got all of these problems and everybody's trying to divide the world. You know what? In my opinion, there's three types of people. There's rich, there's poor, and there's middle class. And it has nothing to do with how much money you make. Uh, my dad, we were dirt poor, but we never acted like we were poor. And then my dad graduated from medical school and was a dentist. And we suddenly, well, within a couple of years, we had a whole lot more money. And, you know, they, I remember the kid next door said, well, oh, well, you wouldn't understand you're rich. We were never really rich. We were middle class. But no matter what we did, we were stuck there. And if I did what my dad told me to do, get more education, save money, invest in a 401k, blah, 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 then I was destined to remain middle class. And I didn't want that in my life. I wanted to be rich, not because I wanted the money, but I wanted what the money could buy. It could buy me enough time that I never had to worry about going to work. I could spend all the time I wanted with my kids. And my wife wanted to homeschool the kids. So that's what we did. And I taught the important subjects, financial education, uh, shooting, and science. And she did the boring stuff like English and whatever. Uh, but that's where we started. And I found that by creating enough value for enough people, then I had time freedom. I could do what I wanted when I wanted. I had financial freedom that allowed me to have all the others. And I had location freedom. I can go anywhere I want, anytime I want. So it really helps to have your own plane to do that. That, by the way, is an awesome thing everybody should strive for. But we can just jump in. And if we want to go somewhere, we jump in the plane and go. And as long as we have an iPad or a cell phone, we can check up on the business, make some decisions, and make sure it keeps running. And if you do that every week, you can be gone for a few weeks and nothing falls apart. Whereas if you are a sole proprietor, if you're the only person, if you're the everything, as soon as you leave, you quit earning money. It's just as bad as being an employee. So what I found, if you want to be, if you want to move out of the poor you have to quit blaming other people and you have to quit focusing on expenses and start learning what an asset is. If you want to move out of middle class, you have to give up on this illusion of safety and security. It is not the way everything in the world changes. And if you become perfect in the middle class, you're perfectly equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. And I look at what is going on with the banking system, with real estate in the last month or two or the last year or so, it is going to be another 2007 moment. And it's not going to be the same, but it will rhyme. So you have to be prepared, looking ahead and ready for change. And if you can do that, not be frightened by that, and realize this is the greatest opportunity I might ever have, then you're thinking like a rich person. And I guarantee you will make mistakes. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be the straight A student. You just have to learn from those mistakes a little bit faster than the other people. Try not to make the same ones again. And I believe that that is how rich people think. 
And that's why if we took all the money in the world and evenly distributed it, roughly this, no more than 10% of the people would change. 90% of the poor people would be poor again in five years. 90% of the middle class people would be middle class again in five years. And 90% of the rich people would be rich again in five years. Not because of their earned income, but because of the way they think. Hmm. So good, man. Thank you so much for, for breaking that down. And, and again, uh, this is just foundational sort of stuff, right? And yeah. you think about, you know, understanding assets and liabilities, and then you think about the, the, the middle class, right? It's like, what was the instruction that I was given was, you know, the same thing Robert Kiyosaki mentions in, uh, in Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's like, stay in school, <clears throat> get good grades, so you can get a good job with good benefits, right? And that ultimately is an illusion because there's, A, there's actually no safety, you know, necessarily in that um, because you could also lose your job. Uh, well, you don't know. forget to pay off all your debts. <laughs> right. Uh, and so it's like, and so it's like the, if you're, if you're following that path, what's ending up to happen is you actually don't have safety. You're just operating out of fear. And I, you know, uh, we were actually, I'm having my son listen to the the book right now and we were on the way to school and, uh, cause he was inspired by Devin's story, by the way. And, uh, and so we were listening and we talked about why was, uh, I, he's, he's like, why do grownups wake up, you know, and rush out the door to go to work when they clearly don't want to, uh, they never seemed all that excited about it. But it's just that fear, right, that continues to drive people. And so many people are operating from that, that they can't get past it. So uh, I love what you're bringing through there. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mike, what's coming up for you? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I, I almost want to shift gears into this parenting because you mentioned uh, that you and your wife homeschooled. And uh, I, we've had a couple of conversations with some guests on the podcast around homeschooling and just parenting principles. So I, I would love to hear from you. Uh, on some of this. So, so specifically you said, I'm going to teach financial and shooting and, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, those are the priorities, right? <laughs> right. right. Uh, so, so teaching finding, uh, breaking down financial principles for a kid. I mean, you're, you're, you obviously at this chapter of life, uh, you've already figured a bunch of things out, but teaching a child financial principles is going to be different than learning it as an adult and teaching it to, in my opinion, I, I, that's why I'm, I, I don't want oh, to Oh, yeah, you're it, absolutely but. right, Mike. It so, is so, just, so much yeah. harder to teach an adult. <laughs> so, because it's almost like uh, teaching, I had this conversation with Matt King when he was teaching, he was a guest on the show, teaching his son baseball. Like, Matt was a college baseball player, but like teaching a kid baseball is a lot different than knowing how to play baseball as a college athlete. So uh, I said, how did you start doing it? He's like, well, I started watching YouTube videos. I'm like, remember, re-remembering what are those base level fundamentals of baseball. So I'm curious from your lens, when you and your wife chose this homeschool, what did you do for you to kind of be reminded of these base level financial principles to teach them to your children? That's number one. And then number two, under the umbrella of homeschool, how did you navigate the 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 idea of having my kids um, be social, or you know, there's always that stigma of like homeschool kids are not going to have like the social acuity as much as other kids, and they might grow up to be like antisocial or weird or not really good with other. They they might lack something like there's there's that stigma, and I'd love to hear you speak to how you and your wife navigated that, and also how you navigated really breaking down these principles into a digestible components where it was easy for a child to comprehend and then implement. Part two first, have you met my child? He has spoken to close to 2 million people since January. So in three and a half months. So I guess the, the result is he is not antisocial. How did we get there? That's like, have you ever jumped out of an airplane? I I have I, one I time. Have not okay. Yeah. So one, I have one, one time. Many many jumps and every we've jumped out of everything you can imagine. And I was an instructor for years, throwing over a thousand people out of the airplane. And all of these people always tell me, "Oh well, I'm never going to do that. You know, I'll do it." If the plane's going down, no, you won't. You'll be terrified, hunker down in the back, and you'll go down in a ball of flames like everybody else. And besides, I don't jump out to save my life. I jump out for fun. Uh, 
And the next thing is, but what if the parachute doesn't open? The parachute always opens. We took a parachute, we rolled it up in a ball, we shoved it in a brown paper bag, jumped out, let go, it opens. They're designed to open, it always opens. Human beings are designed to be social organisms. They will learn that. And I'm telling you, the worst thing you can do is let them sit there and play on a phone on whatever their particular social media thing is at the dinner table. Have them open up and talk to you. They will learn to talk. Devin started college at Kent State when he was 12 years old. He walked into his first physics class at 12 and said, yes, by the way, you can do that. It's not that hard to get him in. And the state pays for it, which is awesome. Uh, he walked in. I said, Devin, you know, I'm thinking he's going to say something like I was half as tall as everybody there. But I ask, so what was it like? Was there any difference between you and the other kids? He goes, eh. Really, the main difference was they were all on their phones. That was his biggest takeaway from his first day in college. Uh, that all of these 18 to 20 year olds were on their phones. And the 12 year olds sitting there, he didn't realize that he was younger or shorter or anything else. It's just he paid attention while they were playing. So the antisocial thing, it's not a thing. It's like your parachute not opening. It just doesn't happen. They are in Taekwondo. They're in Boy Scouts. Uh, Devin was getting a little shy way before he should have started school. So I think he was like three years old. And he was in acting classes for you know one round of acting classes, whatever that is. And he got on stage and sang with a bunch of other three or four year olds. And kind of got out of that. But I know my wife had that problem. She says she was very shy. And I didn't meet her until years later, but she became the lead in multiple plays at the local Players Guild and said, all right, this is how I got over it. So this is what I'm going to do. Devin, you're not going to end up like me. So look at what your problems were as a child and how you overcame them and then do the same thing for your kids. That is how we got over the, the shyness. Ethan, Ethan never had that problem. I have gone to so many things. Devin was speaking. He's on stage at Limitless with all of these huge names. Ken McElroy, Robert Kiyosaki, Mark Victor Hansen, and Devin Woolwin. He's on a panel with a professional football player and a lady that runs a billion-dollar hedge fund. And we have, I think it was 15 at the time, 14 or 15. So I'm off stage at a networking event. And somebody comes up and says, oh, I met your kid. He is so amazing to talk to. You automatically think it's the one that was on stage. It's not. It's always Ethan, the younger one. He works a crowd like you've never seen. He walks up to, it doesn't matter, the biggest speaker there. He just walks up, shakes their hand, says, hello, I'm Ethan, and I'd like to talk to you. Uh, so yeah, that whole antisocial thing hasn't been a problem. We surround them with adults and they learn how to talk to adults. If you would like, you can surround your children by a 20 year old that you don't know and you don't understand what she's teaching that barely graduated from college and has no experience and make that the one adult figure in their life. And then you can surround them with a bunch of eight year olds that are their classmates and let them get socialized that way. And I'm telling you, if you are surrounded by adults at business meetings, you learn how to talk to an adult and you don't miss out on being a kid. You can climb trees and throw, skip rocks and whatever, just like all the kids. That comes naturally. But if you grow up socialized by a bunch of eight-year-olds, it is difficult to fit into a business setting. Mm. And back to your first question. Sorry, would you like to comment on that? No, I was just going to say, I mean, I just think it's so good and uh, such a great lesson for everybody listening. And I mean, what I've noticed is, um, I mean, especially with the craziness of the school systems, right? Uh, and, you know, not even really knowing and having visibility into what's being taught. Um, lots of challenges and problems there. You know, there is this big move, right, towards uh, homeschooling or at least parochial schools or religious schools or different things like that. Uh, and... Ultimately, we have to take responsibility for our child's education and, and pushing them forward. What I love about what you said is just surrounding them with adults. You know, how many kids don't know how to actually speak to adults 
And then they get into a work setting and they're basically, you know, they're not an asset to any company. They can't really, you know, they don't know how to uh, run their own company because they haven't gotten that education. Then they're not even an asset as an employee, right? The, and they're, they, they can't keep a job or they, they're constantly frustrated. So um, yeah, throwing them into those situations is, is so important. So keep going. I want to hear the, the second part of your, your thoughts there. All right. So the second part would be your first question. How do you build a house? How do you build a skyscraper? You don't start with the kitchen. You don't start with what you want it to look like. You start with an incredibly strong foundation, right? That is what we did with our children. We started with the foundation. We taught them. I have a saying that one of the kids loves to use when he's on podcast that it takes a genius or it takes a PhD to teach fourth grade math using calculus, but it takes a genius to teach a fourth grader calculus. If you can, you know, I'm sure I said that wrong. Let the kids say that right. The bottom line is break it down to the fourth grade level. Okay. If you can teach the most complex subjects, at the lowest, easiest level that a fourth grader can understand it. There is next to nothing you need to know in this world that is past fourth grade. Everything important comes by then. If you're a doctor, you're going to know massive amounts of biology, physiology, drug interactions, and chemistry. And you're not going to remember anything past fourth grade and a lot of the other subjects. If you're an engineer, you're going to have Calc 3 and all these crazy math courses. But you're not going to remember a lot of the English and biology that you learned past about fourth grade. Because you don't use it in your life. It just fades away. So we just focused on giving them a really strong basis, a foundation of knowledge that they could use. And when put together, you can come up with everything you needed. We didn't teach them the Pythagorean theorem and say, listen, you need to memorize A squared times B squared equals C squared. No kid's going to want to learn that. But if you tell them, look, we need to figure out if this wall's straight in your new apartment building. So they just put this in and it looks a little crooked. What's a couple of ways we could do that? You get out a level, you put it on the side. Okay, well, that looks good. You put it on the floor. Oh, well, that's the part that's not level. Well, how far are we off? Let's get a tape measure and measure. And you get the question, how do I do that? Well, let's measure up five foot here, over five foot there. And then we'll stretch it in between and measure that. And I have this really cool formula. If you write this down and you just type these numbers in, of course you can use a calculator because, I mean, who doesn't carry a cell phone or a calculator or something? Yeah, just do that. And then you see that little two? That's the square button. Just press X2. And this is how you teach a fourth grader the Pythagorean theorem. And they remember it because it taught them something they cared about. If the wall in their new house is straight or not. And if they learn it and they want to know it, they'll remember it. If you tell them and force them to memorize it, They might regurgitate it for the test, but they'll never understand it. That is how we got our kids going. That is where we started with, in that case, it was a business, you know, construction. We did the same thing with investing. And Devin's first investment, he learned what is the basic to making money in business. He learned buy low, sell high, right? Not exactly what we do, but that's a pretty good sound concept to teach at a young age. And so he decided he was going to buy the most expensive thing he could ever imagine, the Lego Death Star. And that was the big, he loves like, he still likes Legos, but he was really, really into Legos growing up. So he bought the Lego Death Star and built it. And then he decided he wanted to invest. And I've been teaching him his whole life. He comes in into this office standing right beside me here. And I look down because he's five. Now he's taller than me. And 
He says, Dad, you know, I'm five years old. I think it's time for me to start investing. He says, what should I invest in? And I was very proud that he said, what should I invest in and not what should I buy? And thinking, oh my gosh, I have spent his whole life teaching him. There is no age limit. Anybody can invest. You can do this. I know that I will become a total fraud if I can't help him do this. And so I just blurt out what I would tell every adult. Invest in what you know, son. And he thinks really hard. And he looks back up and says, you know, Dad, I, I really only know Legos. I said, fantastic. Go find a way to make money with Legos. And he wanders out looking confused. And I thought, all right, that bought me somewhere between a couple hours to a couple of days. And I have got to come up with something for this kid to invest in. And I'll be done. It wasn't until I read his book. Uh, no, it wasn't until I read his mom's part of our book, Family Success Triangle, that I finally learned the end of that story. But like two days later, he came back in and said, Dad, I figured it out. They retire Lego sets, and when they do, they're going to double in value. And that's what happened with this one and this one. I said, all right, idea, market research. And he doesn't know all these words, right? But that's what he's doing. He has proven that it's happened. And I, I skipped the part about, you know, past performance is not indicative of future performance. I said, well, we'll let him try. As it turned out, he was pretty much right. And then he made so many mistakes buying that, just like every new investor does. But he did it. He took the action. And then he decided he didn't have enough money to buy it. So he picked a partner. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong partner, one with less money than him. So then he learned, always get a partner that brings something to the table that you need. Then he chose not to hire a professional. Even though I have a real estate license, I get one of the real estate agents from my company to represent me. I don't need to waste my time filling out paperwork. I need to be crunching numbers and looking at this, that, or the other thing. So I pay her her little commission, which she is thrilled for, and she looks harder to find me more deals when she gets a commission. Let her keep the 3% of the deal. I'll keep the other 97% when I buy it. And that's something that Devin learned well. Always hire a professional to sell your products. Don't worry about the little commission because he didn't want to pay eBay their commission. Try to do it on Craigslist. And by the time it did, he learned the next lesson. Time is money. If it sits there too long, it loses value. And Lego came out with a new Death Star and the price of the old one started going back down. But in one $500 investment, imagine the lessons that he learned and will remember for life where most of you are buying a $50,000 or maybe a $500,000 property. He learned that on fifty thousand or on $500 when he was five years old. So that is how I taught them the beginning and mm -hmm. gave them a solid foundation through simple, easy lessons. Then I let them fail. I let them fall down and not get hurt too bad, but I definitely wasn't overprotective. I was there to pick them up, but not to prevent them from any pain at all. That's not the real world. And that's another huge lesson we teach in Family Success Triangle, is you got to let them fail every now and then. Not too bad, but enough that they learn. Hmm. And I love when Devin was telling us that story on his episode. So listener, if you didn't listen to Devin's episode, you could hear it from... Uh, from the child's lens, which is really great. And uh, he does a great job telling that. Uh, Eric, uh, before before we uh, head for the exits, I mean, this this um, family success triangle that you just kind of seeded a little bit, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what 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 that means. I mean, two, oh, you, you've had over 2 million copies of your books uh, sold uh, and purchased over the course of uh, two years. And I, I actually have, that is my goal. I am nowhere okay. close to that, but I will. In two years, I'm going to come back here and we can say that. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. I, I misread that. My apologies. But you, so you have, but either way, you're reaching so many people with your content. Uh, I, if you could just kind of talk a little bit about what, 
what the family success triangle is and what, what that means to you, what that means to someone who hears it. Uh, I'd love to hear just uh, the framework around the family success triangle. There is nothing more important in my life than my family. It started with my wife and we decided to grow together. When we got married, I said, what do you want out of this marriage? And she said, adventure. I don't think she realized who she was asking because we've been jumping out of airplanes, flying airplanes and traveling all over, scuba diving with sharks. You name it, we did that. And then my kids came along and I wanted to spend time with them. And we decided we weren't happy with what the school was teaching. Well, what's more important in life? I can always come back and rebuild businesses when they graduate. I just need to bring in enough money now that I can have the time to spend with him. They're only here for what, maybe 18 years, give or take. I wanted to spend that time. But I also needed the money to come in from the businesses that we already had started. So we learned to integrate our family into the business. I got to spend more time, just like today, Devin is working with Lila at the real estate brokerage. And I am home with Ethan going over some homeschooling and actually he's paying his taxes today. They need to be mailed out. It's almost tax day. Uh, So they're learning this and we get to spend more time with them wherever they are. And by them working in our business or on our business, creating new systems, it gives us more free time to spend with them and play. It also makes the business grow so we can make more money. We take the money, we buy more investments, which makes the business grow and gives us more passive income, which gives us more time with them. That's the triangle. Business, family, and investing. And it's not balancing them. It actually is integrating them. Balance means you have to take away one to give to the other. If you really find a way to integrate it, the more you do of one, the better off the other one is. And that's the main essence of our book. The subtitle you mentioned, Be, Do, Have, you've got to be the right person. Then you have to do the right things. It's never about the how. First, you have to be the right person. Then you do the right things. And then you will have everything you want. So Mm. that's the essence of the family success triangle. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, man. If someone's listening and they're like, okay, I'm ready to be, do, have, you know, that do, right? You know, if, if we're going to leave them with something, an action item, a call to action that you want them to do, besides go buy Family Success uh, Triangle, to go do that, everybody. But besides that, like what's something they should do today or this week that's going to set their, their course in motion? What's the most important thing you, that you would encourage someone to do uh, to begin this journey? What would you say to that? You need to take action and not tomorrow. Don't make a note of it. Don't want to do it. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care if you're working a double shift, even if it's midnight or 4 a.m. When you get home, I used to work second shift in the ER there. You have enough energy to do one thing you've never done before. And that one thing needs to move you forward. Part of it should always be education. Listen to this podcast again or another one by you guys or anybody else. If you say, I don't read, then learn to read. Pick up a book and read it and actually do something. Make an offer on a house. Take somebody out to lunch that's done what you want to do. So do one thing today. Don't hesitate. Don't procrastinate. Just take action today that will get you one step further. Uh, Eric, I, I was um, I was just like listening and I'm like, wow, this is really practical because you're saying you know, take someone out to lunch. Very simple. I I love that piece of advice. Justin Donald said he took someone out for lunch every week. It was something for like four years or something like that. Every single week as a missed a week. I think that's an easy action step. Um, you know, do, do something right away. Listener. Uh, I think that's really tactical, simple advice. So, uh, Eric, before we head for the exits, we like to ask every guest, uh, three questions and these are real short hitting questions. If you want to expand, you could expand, but, uh, whatever comes top of mind for you, Uh, The first question is, what do you think the world needs most today? Sound money. It's that simple. We could not have all of this, all the wars. And uh, it realized I spent 13 years in uniform. And I see no reason why Americans should have troops 
in over 150 countries. I don't see any reason we should be paying so much in taxes. And we're really not. We're just printing the money, which is leading to massive inflation, which is wiping out the middle class. And I believe that if we had sound money, we would actually have to tax more to spend on warfare and welfare. And enough people would say, no, nah, that's enough. I'm done. We can't keep spending a trillion or two trillion more than we bring in. So sound money. That's what we need the most in the world. Awesome. Let us know when you're when you're running for office as well, Eric. We'll uh, we'll have you back on and and make sure that we get you elected because that's that's important. Hey, what one to three books besides the one that we've already the ones that we've already mentioned besides your own? What one to three books do you think everyone should read in your opinion? All right. Yeah. Other than everything written by uh, one of my family, Woolwind. Absolutely. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is where both of my kids started. That's absolutely the top of every list. I think a mindset book like Think and Grow Rich or Secrets of the Millionaire Mind are both incredible books. And then a direction book. Uh, So Mike Maloney's Guide to Investing in Silver and Gold, since we were just talking about sound money. If you want to learn about that, you read that book. If you want to learn about real estate, maybe a Grant Cardone or, you know, even Trump has a bunch of books before he was so politicized. Read the real estate books, but a mindset book, a book to help you think different ways, you know, out one about yourself, one outside yourself, and one that is about the business you're in. And there's a handful of titles. It's actually funny you said that. I actually found this book, Why We Want You to Be Rich, way before. By Kiyosaki and Trump. By Kiyosaki and Trump. And uh, I read this before I knew Trump was in politics ever. You know, it was was actually at the dollar store, this really nice, like, hard book. It was at the dollar store. I was like, all right, I'll pick it up for a dollar. Such such good principles that I read in this book. Oh, I can't believe I missed it. Sorry, I have to amend that. (laughs) Atlas Shrugged. It is the only book I own, a first edition, and uh, wow, my favorite book. The license plate on my sports car is Jay Galt. Yes, everyone should read Atlas Shrugged if you haven't already. I've, I, I have it. I opened it, and uh, man, it's a tough read. It's big. That's a beast of a book. So I might have to get the audio book on that one. I love that record. You can get the audio book. It's only like 56 hours. <laughs> I have read it and listened to it probably 10 or 12 times. My All kids right. listened to it while I was driving as they grew up. But for a while, I read it every year. That's good. That's good. Eric, our final question for you is, what does it mean to you to be better than rich? Better than rich. First, you have to have financial freedom. Because without money, you are incredibly limited and probably fighting with your family. You also need to have time freedom. It doesn't make any difference. If you're a brain surgeon, nobody can hold that scalpel but you. So you have to be at work every day. I love real estate because it gives me freedom of time. I can get paid while I'm traveling and while I'm asleep at night. And location freedom. Maybe you just want to sit around on your ranch or your farm or in your orchard. And maybe you like the big city. There's people that like everything. Maybe you like to travel Europe. We kind of like to travel around the U.S. I think there's so many cool places to see here. And we were looking at mountains in Tennessee, and we were in San Diego a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, wild extremes. But I like to be able to travel, and I like to be able to be at home when I want. So financial freedom, time freedom, location freedom. That's better than rich. Oh, fantastic, Eric. This has been so much fun. Uh, if someone's really enjoyed this episode, they're inspired by your story and inspired by uh, what you're up to, how can they stay in touch and and learn more and, and get more value from you? If you want the quick every day, we have multiple things on social media. In fact, I just hired another guy, so it'll be higher quality. But look us up at Real Power Family. And we are fairly active on Instagram. We've got a YouTube and Rumble channel that have the same thing. So pick your better one. And then we just started all of the other social medias. And please sign up for our newsletter. Clearskytrainer.com has a link to our newsletter. And I'm sure Devin brought it up. But if you happen to be in the 8 to 25 age bracket, 
he has a free group called Millionaires in Training or MIT. You can also click on and sign up and all that's free. I'm just trying to get one lesson a week out there to make the world a better place, just like I teach my kids. Well, Eric, this is uh, this is extremely enriching um, for me, and I, I, I just really am so grateful for your time, uh, for meeting your family, and, and Matt Drinkon for making the introduction. And uh, you know, this this message that you're sharing is just so powerful, and I just want to thank you for not only uh, leading a beautiful life and leading a beautiful family, but sharing these principles with the world and on your, on your mission to 2 million lives over the next two years is such a great, powerful mission and positive change is going to start with us. And, and uh, I, I truly believe that. And you're, you're an example of that. So thank you, Eric, for your contribution to the, uh, to the show and to our audience. Uh, and as always, Andrew, thank you for asking such great questions. And listener, of course, thank you uh, for taking your time and dropping by the Better Than Rich show. And assuming this episode helped you, it's your turn. Help others by sharing it with a friend. Subscribe on YouTube. Leave a rating and review. And remember, leave today better than you found it. Till next time. 